If you are not familiar with Dr. Yesis, then to put this interview into context, you have to go back to the early 1950s through to the late 1980s. After being outperformed by the United States at the 1952 Olympic Games, the Soviets would take a very scientific approach to athletic development, investing heavily in the field of sports science. This would pay dividends over the next several decades, with the Soviets not just enjoying athletic success at the Olympics, but the Soviet scientists making huge breakthroughs in the field of sports science. Some Soviet concepts are still regarded as cutting edge today, and some concepts have been nearly forgotten. The Soviet progressions in sports science would reach a fever pitch at the 1988 Olympic Games, with the Soviets taking home nearly twice as many gold medals as the United States, despite the Soviet Union struggling greatly economically and with only a comparative fraction of their athletes having enough money to train full time. A more cynical modern viewer will dismiss the Soviet success as solely down to the use of anabolic steroids. It would be true to say that some Soviet athletes used drugs, and in the case of some female athletes, it reached the level of a human rights abuse. However, if you look at the 100m sprint final from the 1988 Olympics, an event often described as the dirtiest race in history in which a Canadian athlete won only to test positive for steroids and surrender his gold medal to an American who had also tested positive for performance enhancing drugs at the Olympic trials, then it's fair to say that steroid use at the time was nothing that was unique to the Soviet Union. Furthermore, Soviet research into doping, which has received a large amount of attention, and some of which can be found online, found that steroids were counterproductive to success at many sports, such as swimming and gymnastics. If you look here at the physique of Vladimir Yashchenko, then I think it's fair to say only the most paranoid and cynical would think of him as a steroid user. His record for the high jump with the straddle technique still stands today. Furthermore, to give you an idea of how advanced he was despite him using the less efficient straddle technique, his world record setting jump would have earned him a gold medal as recently as the 2015 World Athletics Championships. His world record would be broken by a Polish competitor before Rudolf Pawanetsin set a new world record. Pawanetsin is another Soviet competitor with far less muscle mass than you'd expect a Soviet competitor to have, based off Rocky IV and other media depictions. So on to Dr. Yesis. Dr. Yesis being born in America and coming from a Russian family has the rare ability to be fluent in both languages. Furthermore, with a degree in biomechanics, and a PhD in sport and exercise science, he was in a perfect position to fully understand and translate the Soviet methodology. The concept of plyometrics which he brought to the West is a concept used by almost every athlete with a strength and power component. Furthermore, he uses background in biomechanics to refine a concept first translated as specialized strength exercises, or they're referred to now as dynamic correspondence exercises in the modern sports science literature. During his career, he has worked with many athletes such as Evander Holyfield, Todd Marovinich, the Los Angeles Rams and the Los Angeles Raiders. In terms of the combat sports world, aside from working with Evander Holyfield, he also helped develop the knowledge of Marv Marinovich. For those who remember the way BJ Penn got things together under Marv Marinovich, it was one of the biggest changes in performance ever observed with a fighter getting a new coach. You could also say yes, this is having a knock-on effect on the MMA world now, as Nick Carson, who has been named Trainer of the Year by various media outlets, cites Marmarinic as his trainer, who was taught by Yesis. One final thing before getting into the interview. I will leave timestamps for the audio in the description. In terms of the video, a lot of it will be the Skype conversation, however I will leave timestamps in the description for where certain exercises are being described and pieces of research are being talked about. So my first question uh, is, um, I don't know how closely you follow uh, modern MMA, um, but one strength and conditioning coach who was regarded as kind of being um, revolutionary um, was the late Marv Marinovich. Um, right. Can you describe your working relationship with Marv Marinovich and what you taught him about sports science? All right. Um, I started working with his uh, son when he was 13. Okay. And that's when I started working with Mark. At that time, he was the uh, strength and conditioning coach for the uh, then uh, Los Angeles Rams. 
and that was the American football team. See, and the Rams were in Los Angeles, then they went to St. Louis, now they're back in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, so anyway, this was back, I don't remember the exact year, but I believe it was in the early 80s. All right, so uh, he asked me to work on, you know, his son and his technique. So I started at that time. And then I don't just do an analysis of technique because anytime there's something deficient in technique, I come up with a specialized strength exercise that duplicates what the person has to learn or develop the musculature and movements in, to enable him to do whatever it is that I'm requesting. So okay. uh, this is where Mark came in. I had the exercises and he had the gym. Uh, so I said, okay, this is what, you know, Todd needs. And he would carry it out. I would take Todd through, you know, the motions, but make sure the exercise was being done correctly. Uh, and then Marv would uh, make sure it was done. So he was my uh, strength on, if I can use that term loosely. Because he was already in a strength game and he knew most of the exercises. But I would give him some specialized ones and he would administer them to Todd. So uh, that's kind of how we started. And, and it continued this way uh, for several years. Uh, okay, so. great. And another strength and conditioning coach um, who's gained a lot of popularity in the MMA world is um, Nick Carson. He was named MMA Trainer of the Year in 2018. And Carson cites his trainer as Marv Marinovich. So, I guess in some ways you could trace the lineage kind of back to you. Um, is well, Carson someone that you've ever kind of uh, met or trained with personally? No. no. I don't know him. I, I've done uh, quite a bit of MMA work. Okay. But not with the uh, professionals. Uh, okay, then. I can't remember the name. It, it was an offshoot. Uh, it was from Indo Indochina. All right, then. It was their main, main type of... Uh, MMA. Okay. Uh, so I, I know the movements are involved and uh, many of the people and, uh, and and so on, but I don't know Carson. Now, All right. Then. Okay. So um, one aspect of the Soviet system, I guess, which you've uh, kind of brought over to the USA, um, which they kind of haven't adopted, which I think you've already mentioned so far, um, is the use of these specialized strength exercises um, because I think the things that they brought in in terms of the strength and conditioning training were things like um, like high rep rapid rates of force development and kind of more of the explosiveness side of things. Um, but in terms of skill execution, um, I guess you've brought over the, some of the um, specialized strength exercises. So can you explain to somebody who might be watching um, exactly what a specialized strength exercise is in more detail? Uh, yes, because this is a very misunderstood area. Mm -hmm. uh, most people think of specialized strength exercises as exercises good for a sport. Yeah. Well, they, they really have nothing to do with the sport. Okay. Uh, let me take that back. Uh, this is a very poor way of defining them. Uh, a specialized strength exercise duplicates a particular movement or a neuromuscular pathway. Mm -hmm. So... And that's only one criteria. Mm -hmm. There are oh, five or more criteria that you can use, but I only use three. Okay. Uh, it's simpler to understand that way. Mm -hmm. Number one, it has to duplicate the neuromuscular pathway. So we're duplicating the exact technique. Uh, number two, it has to duplicate the exact range of motion over which strength is developed. So, for example, uh, I'm doing a knee drive. It's mm -hmm. an exercise where you start with the leg behind the body. Then you drive the knee forward under the body and out in front. Well, many people do a, uh, an exercise beginning with the leg directly under the body and just bring it in front. 
Okay. They, they call this, you know, uh, an exercise for the hip flexors, mm -hmm. which it is. But see, but when I bring with, start with the leg behind the body, it's a different range of motion. Mm -hmm. So I'm developing strength over the beginning range of motion. I if see, you start yes. with the leg underneath the body and drive it upward, you're developing strength in the latter half of the uh, range of motion. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes the exercises different. So that's where that criteria, criteria comes in. You develop strength over the range of motion, which is needed in that sport. Then I see, three, yeah, makes sense. So in that example that you oh, gave there's, of... There's one more criteria. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, and that is, it duplicates the same type of muscular contraction. Okay. So is it a, uh, an explosive contraction? Is it a strength movement? Is it a powerful strength movement? You know, is it light strength? So these, these questions get answered. Okay. So all three have to be in effect for the exercise to become specialized. Okay. Cool. Um, so in that example that you gave of the knee drive exercise, um, I guess uh, the kind of um, starting with the leg behind uh, the body, um, I guess that would probably be more of a, a running specific uh, exercise um, from my sort of lay understanding of biomechanics. Um, would you uh -huh. say the other exercise you described, would that be more... Uh, specialized towards a kicking action or would, uh, starting with the leg behind the body be um, more beneficial for, for both kind of actions, I guess? All right. It's really a combination of both. It's specific to uh, running yeah. because this is what happens in a running stride. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but it's also specific uh, to sports such as MMA. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to be kicking, you have to drive the thigh forward before mm -hmm. you can, you know, raise the thigh up enough to, to kick the person. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's involved in wrestling movements. Uh, you're, you know, pulling and tugging and whatnot, and you want to roll over, you drive the knee mm -hmm. and then roll over. So the, the knee drive or driving the knee forward is used in many different sports mm -hmm. and for many different movements. Mm -hmm. It's not just isolated to running mm -hmm. but in terms of the range of motion of the knee drive because um, it seems to me like in terms of the kicking action uh, in sort of kickboxing or MMA or any kind of martial arts um, you would kind of um, you wouldn't have the same range of motion as you would in running or I think you'd have like slightly more is is that right or is that uh, uh, not necessarily more okay um, See, it, it most, let's say, in the MMA, in the kick. Yeah. Uh, usually you take a stride. So now your leg or the thigh is slightly behind the body. I see, yes, I see, I see. I see. The, and then you drive it. But it's not through the full range of motion as, as it is in running. Okay, yeah. So every sport kind of gets adjusted. I see. But there's nothing wrong with going slightly behind. Who okay. knows when you might be in a position that will, that will uh, need that or require it. Mm -hmm. So you should Make always train for the unexpected. I see, yeah, makes sense. Um, so specialized strength exercises, um, from what I understand, this was something you picked up uh, in the old Soviet Union. Um, can you describe how they were being used at the time in the old Soviet Union? All right. Uh, they were very crude. Uh, and now it's just the beginnings of what we think of as specialized strength exercises today. Okay. Uh, they, oh, it, it's hard to explain. We think today, you know, we have all this equipment, uh, you know, gyms and so on. We can do many of these things. But back in the day, when this, when this started, there was no equipment the way, the way there is today. Mm -hmm. They had, bar they, excuse me, they had barbells and dumbbells, but that was it. Okay. Uh, but, you know, some of the machines that we have today, or uh, let's say, uh, 
or, or the different racks and so on. This was unheard of. Mm-hmm. So at the beginning, they used, you know, like uh, rope tied up in, in bundles, mm-hmm. you know, to get some weight or to be able to grip something. Everything was improvised, very crude. Okay. But this is how they did the exercises. Mm-hmm. And, it was, and it was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, even when I first started doing them, I didn't have much more. Mm-hmm. I took the concept, and as your equipment evolved, or even as I developed the equipment, see, if I, for example, I developed the active cords, as I call them. Uh, these are enabled me to do many exercises, such as the knee drive, for example. Mm-hmm. Without these cords, it's very, very difficult to do that exercise. Mm-hmm. The way the Russians did them, uh, they would have somebody hanging on wall bars, and then you have a weight on the foot that you would have to tie up to hold it there, like a weight boot, uh, which we knew way back when. Today, most people don't even know what a weight boot is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you drive the thigh forward, mm-hmm. or you're li- lying on a horse with the leg all the way down, you face up, then you drive the knee upward with a weight tied onto the foot. Mm-hmm. See, and most people don't even know what a horse is, but unless you were in gymnastics. So you see how it evolved over time. But with the act of cords, I was able to duplicate a lot of these movements. And we had to differentiate general from specialized. General training is good for conditioning. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get stronger, but you don't necessarily improve your sports performance. To yeah. do this, you need specialized strength exercises. Okay. That's the key. <laughs> and in some ways, would you say, I guess, the, um, like the active cords, um, they're kind of essential to doing some of the specialized exercises in terms of kind of um, developing horizontal force with sort of... Um, with certain actions um, that, I mean, I think to me that kind of becomes almost impossible to do if you're using like a dumbbell or a barbell. I mean, maybe like a bench press, you can lie on your back and sort of create horizontal force with the chest. But um, for certain joint angles, uh, would it be true to say that it's, uh, it's very, very hard to do without the active cords? Or is that? Well, let's not say hard to do, impossible to do. Yeah, yeah, okay. See, with the active cords, I can develop uh, strength in any direction. See, that's the beauty of them. See, you're not limited by gravity, as you are with dumbbells and barbells. Okay. You have to work against gravity uh, to get any benefit or to develop strength. But with the active cores, it's not needed. The cores provide the resistance in any and all directions. Okay. And you can yeah, buy they, they the active cords on your website, is that right? Yes, they're available on a website. Okay, then. So in terms of um, these specialized strength exercises, um, in terms of research, um, would you say that a lot of the research on these exercises um, existed in the old Soviet Union in the sort of Russian strength and conditioning journals? um, And has all of that been translated? I know you translated some of it, but is there maybe some of it some of the research still there that uh, people aren't aware of? Or... Uh, I translated a minimal amount of what was available. Okay. The, the, the Russians had, or I should say the Soviets at that time, uh, had books monthly that came out, coaches' manuals, mm-hmm. that came out every month or at least once a year. And these journals show the different exercises that were available, new uh, training methods, uh, and so on. So they were very prolific. And everything that they came up with, they put in print right away. So all the coaches in the nation would be able to use them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like today, especially I don't know how it is in England, but uh, here in the United States, everybody is... Oh, that's my idea. I don't want to give away any secrets. That's the secret to our success. You know, mm-hmm. if the team wins, then it becomes yeah. very secretive. Yeah, there's a football team in the United States. 
San Diego, uh, not San Diego, San Francisco uh, 49ers. They did some exercises that I developed, like the knee drive and so on. Mm -hmm. And they had the most explosive linemen, many from doing that exercise. Yeah. It, it enabled them to drive forward and, and knock the opponents down very quickly mm. or, or to stop them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know how I got there, but you, you can see how these exercises can really make a difference mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the performance of the team. Mm -hmm as it did with the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And would it be true to say that the uh, the specialized uh, kind of strength exercises, they became most important um, once you were dealing with the higher level athlete, uh, as maybe with the lower level athlete, general or specific, wasn't as important as it was with the, the higher level athlete? This is where they find their greatest value. Mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, high level athlete. Mm -hmm. Now, they're great for beginners, but beginners, uh, just getting in shape is more important. For example, I developed a program called the 1 by 20 strength training system. Mm -hmm. uh, we use this with all athletes at the beginning uh, and with youngsters. Uh, we begin strength training oh, anywhere from 9 to 12 years of age. Mm -hmm. And at this time, they need strength development. They, they got to develop the whole body. Mm -hmm. Working on sports movements uh, or, you know, playing the sport is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's what gets me with what we do here in the United States. Everybody's so interested in playing. Nobody's interested in developing the athlete first and then playing. So with the one by 20, we want to develop the whole body, mm -hmm. every joint, every muscle. And the one by 20 is great for this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an exercise for every movement in every joint. Like, for example, the ankle is capable of doing four different movements, flexion, extension, adduction, abduction. Mm -hmm. So there's an exercise for each one of those. Mm -hmm. So that's four exercises that they have to do. For the knee joint, uh, there's flexion extension. We have two exercises for that. Standing leg flexion, standing uh, leg extension. The hip joint, at least four exercises. Because we bring the leg forward in flexion, out to the side, abduction, inward, adduction, and backward extension. So every joint is treated this way. And we do over 20 different exercises. And we do 20 or more repetitions. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, wow, 20 repetitions, every exercise, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Not if you're gonna do three sets it is, but you only do one set. That's all you need at the beginning. Anyone who has never strength trained before, it's a waste of time to do more than one set. So by doing over 20 different exercises for all the joints of the body, all the major muscles of the body, we get a very strong athlete. And in addition, they become more uh, expert at executing the skills of the sport. Okay. Because every skill requires a combination of many different movements. I see. So, you know, by doing this program, and sometimes we do it for two or more years with the youngsters, mm -hmm. as long as they get stronger or keep getting stronger, uh, then we, keep, we stay on the program. Once the gains slow down, then we move on to the next stage of training, which will vary yeah. depending upon the sport. Yeah. If you're an endurance athlete, it requires one type of training. If mm -hmm. you're a strength athlete, it's another type of training. Mm -hmm. And the gradients within each. Okay. Uh, strength exercise usually adds a team player or play, plays on a team sport. Uh, 
So I think that uh, point that you made about um, people being uh, very secretive sometimes about their training um, kind of really sort of strikes home in terms of the UK because a lot of the sort of big soccer teams that people look to um, as being kind of like the most advanced in terms of their training, a lot of them are very secretive and they don't kind of share the information with each other. Um, what I think was unique about the Soviet system um, was the fact that because it was kind of, um, if I understand it right, because it was government sort of run, um, a lot of them, they kind of shared the research with each other. Um, is that true or am I kind of uh, misinterpreting that? No, 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 that's true. The whole idea was to get the information out to all the coaches. See, even on the elite level, uh, once a year they would bring in all of the coaches mm. from all over the country. Then we have seminars and experiences and show what everybody's doing so they can all learn what everyone else was doing, mm -hmm. especially the more successful ones. Okay. Yeah, there was no such thing as, hey, that's mine, I'm going to keep it. Mm -hmm. No, they, they shared right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. That was one of the secrets of their whole system. Mm -hmm. You didn't just develop expertise in one or two coaches. Mm -hmm. It was across the board. Mm -hmm. But of course, there were you know, one or two coaches that excelled, depending upon the athletes that they got and were more recognizable, or maybe they did research in certain areas, like when they took, uh, he did a great deal of research on uh, specialized training mm -hmm. or transfer of training. Mm -hmm. so you get the transfer of the exercise to the skill execution only if it's specialized. Mm -hmm. In general training, just getting stronger doesn't mean that the strength transfers to the actual sports performance. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, things kind of uh, differ uh, in terms of, I think, the UK and in some ways perhaps the US as well, in that in the UK there's kind of a um, sort of a disproportionate number of studies done on sort of beginner level athletes. So I think um, when it comes out and people see the news that say um, squatting will increase your sprint speed or something along those lines, um, people can kind of get stuck on the general exercise because there's constantly kind of news about these general exercises. Whereas maybe with the Soviet system in the more advanced athlete, um, these kind of studies done on say squatting versus the knee drive um, they would reveal that there was sort of uh, not as effective results in, in that scenario. Um, is that true or? Yeah, all right. Let me uh, explain one thing here. Uh, and I, it's probably the same in the UK as it is here. Okay. We do not def differentiate athletes. Mm -hmm. If you're a uh, football player, or a lacrosse player, soccer player. It doesn't mean that your performance or an elite. These are two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And we do an exercise, usually with beginners or intermediates, and then we apply it across the board to all of the athletes. This is wrong. You have to have exercises specific to beginners, exercises specific to those who are intermediate, and exercise specific to the elite or high-level athlete. We have to differentiate not only the exercises, but also the sport and the athlete. Mm -hmm. See, the Soviets were great at this. They had what they called a uh, master of sport that was on the highest level. Mm -hmm. And they had first class, second class, third class. Mm -hmm. First class was the group good athlete. Uh, second class was a little, little less. He was uh, pro pura. And then on, on level three, he was more the beginner or intermediate. Mm -hmm. Whereas here in the United States, we don't have anything like this. An athlete is an athlete. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, he goes to a place on a college. Doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Let's say if it's a runner, how fast does he run? Does he run a, a 10 second hundred or 11 second or 10.5? Mm -hmm. This is what separates them. So mm -hmm. like for the Russians, uh, and, and, and don't quote me on these numbers, I forgot what they were or are. They would have a first class athlete who let's say ran uh, 10 seconds. Um, a level two athlete or level, level one athlete, maybe he ran 10.4. Uh, uh, or a bit. Third level, maybe they ran 11. See, so each athlete got categorized. He's a level athlete. He's a level number one athlete. If his performance is this, he's a level two athlete. If his performance was this, mm -hmm. this is how they differentiate an athlete. And more specifically, the exercises or the exercise program for each level of athlete was mm -hmm. different. It wasn't the same. Now, mm -hmm. of course, they overlapped and some exercises were the same, but the execution might have been different mm -hmm. or the speed of execution was different. See, there were differences on every level. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in the UK, uh, a lot of the studies, they usually just divide trained or untrained um, without too much kind of uh, nuance to it. Maybe if you read it in detail, you can kind of uh, find find out exactly how long they've been training for. But um, what would you say to someone who may be watching, who might be interested in trying their own kind of um, specialized exercises? Um, for instance, I've read in some of the strength and conditioning journals um, in the UK, they have, uh, they've had like, boxers trying punches uh, with a band tied around their wrist. And then I've seen um, Taekwondo athletes doing kicks with band tied around their ankle. Uh, from what I understand, if it was sort of a true kind of dynamic correspondence exercise, you would have um, maybe like something around the hips. Uh, if you're kicking, you might have like one around the ankle, maybe one around the thigh. Um, but even in these studies, they were still kind of getting good results. Um, so would you kind of recommend trying trying out your own? Would it be better than just doing general training or would it be too kind of like risky trying to create your own kind of um, specialized strength exercise? All right. Uh, what I recommend is really doing an exercise for every joint action. Mm -hmm. See, when you try duplicating, you know, or let's say putting a a rubber tube to your wrist and trying to duplicate the punch and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. The okay. resistance changes the direction of the movement, mm -hmm. especially when you get a little, uh, a little bit more resistance. So isolate it more. You do each one separately, they'll all come together. Okay. When you do one exercise, when you put it into the total skill, uh, it might feel a little weird at the beginning, but then you, you'll get used to it and you'll see the results. For example, I remember working with a golfer, uh, he, and he was going to go away uh, for a couple of weeks. So I told him, well, take the active course with you and do these exercises. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, he, he did them. He came back. He says, Doc, my swing is terrible now. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to swing in the club, which I didn't do for a couple of weeks. I said, well, give it time. Mm -hmm. uh, give it a few days. At the end of the week, then tell me how you're doing. At the end of the week, he says, hey, you won't believe it. I'm hitting better than I ever did in my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, it, it took a while to take the strength that he developed and have it show up in execution of the swing. Yeah. This is true of all, all, all our sports. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so in terms of if you were saying doing a specialized uh, strength exercise towards a roundhouse kick, in the mm -hmm. study uh, that I was talking about, they tied it around the ankle. Um, so in terms of, because you also use your hips uh, during like the kicking action, um, would you say 
doing one exercise uh, kicking with the resistance around the ankle and then one with the resistance around the hips, uh, would, would they kind of bounce, cancel each other out or would you recommend kind of uh, putting it all together or would you sort of uh, do one for one level of athlete and one for another kind of level? No, see, I, I would separate them. See, mainly because when you, uh, let's say, put a rubber, uh, put some resistance around the hips, some resistance around the foot, you're not getting equal development. Okay. You're going to rely on one joint or the other. But when you do it separately, then you can really zero in uh, whatever joint it is and develop the strength that's needed. Okay. So I, I would not, uh, you know, do both. And see, especially for a roundhouse, mm -hmm. uh, the hip flexors are the key. Okay. See, and then, of course, there's knee extension, depending upon how the kick is executed. Are you mm -hmm. driving it with a knee drive? Or are you driving forward more of an extended leg? Okay. See, so here's where you would change the execution. If you want to make it faster, then you have to do the knee drive with the knee bend. Okay. And then when you get the full range of motion of the hip flexors, then you bring in the knee extensors. Okay. Not simultaneously. Then. See, one will come right on the, uh, the heels of the other. Okay. If you want to get to transfer, you have to start the new action on the old action. As the old action is slowing down in its power or effect, then the new action comes in. So therefore, therefore you get the, the transfer mm -hmm. of the force developed from that first action into the next action. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, that's where kind of doing a biomechanical analysis will kind of come in uh, in terms of telling you which part of the action is lacking, although that's uh, kind of something you need uh, access to an expert to uh, be able to probably make that determination, I guess. Uh, yes, you hit the nail on the head. Okay. Uh, the biomechanical analysis is critical. You have to be able to analyze what the person is doing and then come up with the exercises that they need. Okay. And too many people say, they, oh, I, I can see what the person is doing by eye. Impossible. Mm -hmm. You have to have an analysis. You have to film the athlete. Mm -hmm. You have to film the athlete then look at each frame, frame by frame. If this is not done, you're not doing an analysis. You don't know what the athlete is really doing. Okay. I have a trained eye. I've been doing this for, uh, what, 60 years? Uh, so I, I can, you know, look at some person in, in live TV and come up with a pretty good idea of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But I still need the frame by frame mm -hmm. to see the exact range of motion uh, and other actions. Mm -hmm. Even a sprinter, a high-level sprinter, a world-class sprinter, mm -hmm. it's impossible to know how high the thigh goes on the knee drive. Mm -hmm. You have to have it on film. Uh, so you have to see, especially the end ranges of motion. Mm -hmm. So um, another thing uh, that you're kind of credited with, I mean, I would say the kind of specialized strength exercises, that's something that's kind of... Um, I don't know if it's like sort of a secret or it's maybe something that's kind of been forgotten a little bit. But um, one thing you're probably more well known for is uh, kind of bringing plyometrics uh, to the West. Um, can you describe what are some of the sort of problems that you see uh, with the way people are generally tending to do plyometrics in the West? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I remember this very well. See, when I brought, I, I was over in the Soviet Union, and I met and worked with uh, Dr. Yuri Verhoshansky, mm -hmm. who is the creator of plyometrics, uh, a brilliant person with, uh, you know, what he did. So I came back to the United States and exposed everybody to plyometrics. Well, it took off, and mainly in the fitness industry, 
And then everybody started doing, oh, we're doing plyometrics. Well, they saw it involved jumping. Mm -hmm. But all jumps, all, let's say all jumps are plyometric. Let me take that back. All jumps involve all plyometric exercises involve jumping or some form of jumping with the same mechanism involved. Mm -hmm. But not all jumps are plyometric. See, that's the key. Mm -hmm. Plyometrics involves jumping, but all jumps are not plyometric. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it took off in the fitness industry, Everybody started doing jumping, but they weren't explosive. For true plyometrics, the jumps had to be executed in one to two tenths of a second, very explosively. Mm -hmm. But if you execute the jump in, uh, let's say, three tenths or four tenths of a second, which most jumps are, they're kind of slow because you're going all the way down and all the way up. Uh, it's not plyometric. Mm -hmm. Plyometric exercise, as soon as that foot hits, boom, you're off. You're, you're taken off again. So we evolved into two different types of plyometrics, or what are known as plyometrics. Mm -hmm. uh, all jump exercises became plyometric, mm -hmm. which is erroneous. Uh, but true plyometrics is more or less typified by let's say the uh, shock method, mm -hmm. uh, or a depth jump. See, that's true plyometrics. Mm -hmm. But only if executed correctly. See, here's the kicker. And we have to take a look at how high they go. The height is related to the length of time spent on the ground. Mm -hmm. The quicker you execute the movement, the higher you go. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, I don't know how to describe both types, but most people and most early books that came out on plyometrics dealt with general strength, general jump exercises mm -hmm. that develop strength, but not explosive power. Oh, you got a little bit. So I use these types of exercises as a, as a warm up or prelude mm -hmm. to doing true plyometrics. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, people can learn more about uh, plyometrics in your book, um, Explosive Plyometrics, is that, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, then. I, I came up with books on most of these topics, or in most sports. Uh, for example, my latest book, Explosive Hitting. Uh, this goes into many different sports. It goes into the martial arts, mm -hmm. because there's hitting involved. Mm -hmm. You're punching. That's a hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and a baseball bat or you know, cricket. How hard you? How hard you're hitting the ball? Mm -hmm. What's what are the key elements here? Mm -hmm. uh, so no matter what type of hitting it is, you have to differentiate, and you can do exercises specific to it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of. Um taking the plyometrics and potentially making them kind of more specific uh, to a sport. Um, if you look at martial arts um, as or combat sports as one uh, kind of sport, um, in a lot of uh, styles like boxing, kickboxing, you have that kind of um, slide with the feet on, on the ground, kind of like, I'll call it like a glide into range. Um, in terms of doing a specialized plyometric for that action could you uh potentially do a like a drop jump um or a depth jump from height uh, drop down and then sort of instead of rebounding and going up vertically could you turn that into a horizontal kind of slide along the ground to kind of um work on a more explosive first step would that be something that would work or sure yeah okay Ooh. Or, or you know, if you want to go horizontally, you can do uh, front and back jumps. See, they, okay. they can be plyometrics mm -hmm. if they're done quickly. Okay. Cool. Um, so, 
In terms of uh, drop jumps, um, a statistic I sometimes hear is something along the lines of if you can squat two times your body weight, uh, then you're ready to do drop jumps. Um, I think that usually refers to kind of like maybe like a 30 inch drop jump, which is, I guess, some people use that as a gold standard of sort of like the most effective uh, kind of uh, for max power. Um, do you kind of scale people up with plyometrics from a sort of a shallower height from the beginning? Or do you kind of get to that kind of strength standard or um, roughly how, when do you kind of tend to incorporate them um, when you're training? All right. First, let me uh, uh, bring out a couple of things. You don't need X amount of weight to be able to squat two and a half times body weight. That's hogwash. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are no limits. You can start at any level, but you don't want to start if somebody's a rank beginner. Plyometrics is very explosive and can be injurious. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Have how much preparation or exactly how much? Nobody knows. Okay. And I don't think it's that important. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you have enough strength to execute a jump? Period. Mm -hmm. And if you can, there's no problem with doing some of these jump exercises. Mm -hmm. And if you're very weak, uh, a rank beginner, do jump exercises, not plyometric, true, true plyometric. Okay. But as you're ready for it, shorten, uh, see, there are many variables here. Shorten the amount of drop height. Instead of dropping down from, let's say, 30 inches, mm -hmm. uh, I always have the athletes start with, let's say, 12 inches. Okay. 12 inches is still going to give you a good effect. Mm -hmm. So drop down from 12 or maybe drop down from 10. And jump up again. So, yeah, you have to adjust the exercise to the athlete. Mm -hmm. Don't go by what is written or a plyometric jumping. No, that's only later when you're ready for it. It's like any principle of strength training. Mm -hmm. You have to be ready for the exercise. When should you gain weight uh, or you know, add more weight? When you're capable of doing it, mm -hmm. especially for the amount of uh, repetitions that are needed. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you were looking at, say, a boxer who was competing for 12 rounds, uh, for example, um, I think a lot of people would say they've generally got to do a lot of kind of endurance training as well to get them ready to kind of uh, fight for that long. So um, do you think uh, they will have enough time to be able to sort of uh, do enough strength and power training to scale up to say the full 30 inches? Um, or would you, I don't know, is there like a trade off there between endurance and power or do you think you can get to uh, uh, enough kind of strength to be able to withstand that kind of 30 inch uh, kind of drop jump? in a very advanced athlete, this is hypothetically, uh, kind of speaking. Yeah, that, that, that's always a tough one. Okay. How much of one thing or another? Yeah. And I think it's going to really depend upon uh, the athlete and his opponent. Mm -hmm. For example, his opponent uh, fresh at the end of 15 rounds or mm -hmm. 12 rounds, whatever it might be. If yeah. that's the case, I would lean a little bit more toward the, uh, the aerobic training. Mm -hmm. Or does he run out of gas very quickly? Then I would lean more toward the anaerobic. So okay. uh, this is where a, a good coach knows the opponent and knows them well. Okay. Then he has to adjust the training in preparation for the fight. Okay. Yeah. So... Um if there was one sort of plyometric exercise uh, that you could kind of single out uh, just quickly um, as the best one for kind of combat sports, um, it might vary with each sport, but um, would it be drop jumps or is there another kind of uh, exercise that you think um, might be the most effective? Well, that's a, that's a tough one, uh, mainly because... It's, 
if you're talking about a kick, it's one thing. If mm -hmm. you're talking about a punch, it's another thing. Okay. So I think I would look at what does the athlete need? Okay. Where is he lacking? Mm -hmm. And then come up with an exercise to fill the void of where he is lacking. Okay, then. All right. And um, just looking at uh, kind of an example of a general uh, kind of uh, strength exercise, um, do you think Olympic weightlifting is very effective uh, for most um, sort of martial arts and combat sports, or um, or do you think more specialized training? Is that a bit too general, or is it still effective for some sort of movements and actions? No. Uh, this is this is something that has permeated the strength and conditioning uh, field, the weightlifting. To me, it's a waste of time, okay. and you shouldn't get involved in it because there's much, there's quite a bit of a learning curve. You have to learn the Olympic lifts, mm -hmm. and they're not easy. Um, see, and this came to be because go back in the early beginnings, like I mentioned earlier, we didn't have the equipment. We didn't have the range of exercises. Very crude. But what mm. did they have? They had excellence in weightlifting. Mm. So they picked up and did the weightlifting exercises to develop some of the Uh, flexibility and this they had. So it kind of stayed with the coaches. Mm -hmm. Keep up with the strength training, uh, with the uh, Olympic lifting. But it's not needed. Today we have many other methods that are superior to Olympic lifting. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't recommend it anymore. It's not needed. And it takes too much time to learn the exercises. Uh, when people bring up Olympic weightlifting, um, it, a lot of the time it kind of descends into a debate of um, is squatting really low like weightlifters kind of do? Yeah. Right. Um, is that going to be come with a, a risk of injury? Um, but I kind of think a more relevant uh, debate might be are you going to squat that low in your sport and might you be better off kind of training other ranges of motion rather than focusing on this uh, one that very rarely comes up. Um, do you think that's a, uh, a more relevant debate? Or Yeah, and, and uh, I would even question uh, the idea of a debate. Mm -hmm. There should be no debate. Mm -hmm. and it's like I brought out earlier. The depth should depend upon what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll throw a question at you. Mm -hmm. And say, uh, or a, a jumper, uh, or any other team sport athlete, how low do they ever go in terms of producing force? Yeah. Um, well, if I you think, look at um, it closely. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well. Um, I think even there's like a move called a uh, a double leg, I guess, you know, like a wrestler taking somebody down and stuff like that. But uh, when you look at it, usually they're kind of bent forward at the waist. And in terms of like the thigh angle, it's usually kind of like a sort of a, a half squat or a quarter squat position. Um, in terms of uh, in MMA, in terms of the grappling on the ground, uh, sometimes you can be very low. But I think a lot of the time... If you look a bit more closely at that, you kind of see that they're um, they're kind of perching on one knee or something like that in those kinds of scenarios when they're on the ground. They're not really squatting low. Uh, they just kind of prop up on a knee or like on an arm or something like that. Uh, see, I uh, think you kind of answered the question. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of flexion in knee joint. Mm -hmm. The most usually is about a quarter to a half squat. There's no need to go any deeper. Mm -hmm. You can even check it out with a squat. Try doing a quarter squat, and it's going to be maybe 100 or 200 pounds more than what you can do in a full squat. Mm -hmm. 
the, this is where your power is. And even in kicking, it's the last, ex, last full extension of the arm, or, or the leg rather, mm. that's going to give you the power. Same thing in punching. It's the end of the punch, not the beginning of the punch when your hand or fist is close to your chest. You mm. have no power mm. there. But as you get a straighter arm, now you got power. Okay, then. So if I understood that right, um, that kind of doing developing power, sorry, in the quarter squat position, um, in terms of like the leg that's posting or rotating on a roundhouse kick, the kind of extension in that leg, um, is that leg effectively doing a quarter squat and would doing quarter squats kind of help with the kicking action uh, a little bit there? Is that true? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, then. I didn't think about yes. that before, but that's quite interesting then. Um, and I guess that would apply with kind of depth jumps as well. That would help with that aspect of the kicking as well. Uh, if you're doing that. Kicking and punching. Yep. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. the same uh, principles involved here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so one athlete that you're uh, kind of often credited uh, with working with is um, Evander Holyfield. Uh, uh -huh. Can you describe uh, the work that you did with him for a little bit? Okay, I didn't do too much work with him uh, hands-on. A lot of okay. it was with his trainer. Okay. Uh, so I would gear him more toward the explosive type. Mm. Uh, and he had a few differences. I'm trying to remember what they were in, in his training, the way he was throwing a punch. Yeah, he wasn't okay. getting the body change. That's what it was. So okay. this is where I wanted more uh, hip and shoulder rotation instead of just relying on just from the hands, get the shoulder coming in, shoulder mm -hmm. coming in. So this is where he, he was lacking in more power, and hopefully he got more power from some of the exercises mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't see everything that the trainer was doing. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I... I want to do now would take a look at the event what he and make these recommendations on what he was doing okay and so roughly uh what kind of uh time frame was that can you remember what was it like uh 90s or was it 2000s or um, late 80s mm -hmm. maybe i don't remember okay then. i think it was in the 80s okay late 80s okay I yeah. thought that was the uh, the best uh, version of um, probably Holyfield. I thought uh, I thought his explosive power was very good, kind of late eighties, early nineties. I thought, um, uh, yeah. Um, have you worked with many uh, gymnasts during your your career? No, no. Oh, okay. uh, which is interesting. Uh, I was a gymnast in high school. Oh, okay. You would think I would have migrated more toward gymnastics but I did work with a few coaches when I was teaching at the university I worked with the uh, gymnastics coach and we did quite a few uh, strength exercises mm -hmm. uh, one that I created and it's in my explosive training uh, book was doing handstand jumps okay yeah see and that's typically not an exercise that you're going to see most people doing Mm -hmm. But why do they need it? They needed it off the uh, the vault. You know, whatever the sun was, they had that final push mm -hmm. off the vault. Okay. Then. And so those handstand jumps, um, is that an exercise that would help uh, people training in martial arts generally? Are there many actions uh, do you think they would help with, or is that more for other sports? Other sports. Okay. See, and, and here again, to answer your question, and what most coaches should be thinking of, where do I see it in my sport? Mm -hmm. Or where would this movement be effective if I created a different movement? Mm -hmm. words, you have to try and answer, do I really need it? And yeah. for what movement? Or for what action? That's mm -hmm. the key. Don't... Uh, don't do as many coaches do. Do an exercise because, oh, that's a great exercise. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, it could be a terrific exercise. Mm-hmm. But if it's not going to make a better athlete, why do it? Mm-hmm. it? Takes time and energy. It's a waste. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what would you say to someone who would say that you can't teach speeds? Well, two things. Mm-hmm. The idea that speed is teachable is erroneous. Mm-hmm. You don't teach speed, you develop speed. Okay. Yeah. Can you increase speed? Yes. That's, and I think that's what they're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Can you increase speed? And by that they say, can you teach it? Mm-hmm. Oh, sure you can. And you can increase speed. Uh, all right, maybe let me back up. Speed is in me. Mm-hmm. You're not going to go any faster than what your body is capable of doing. Mm-hmm. But what's missing is that most runners never get to the maximum that they're part, that they're capable of. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to increase speed to get at the max that they can do. Uh, so in this respect, we're increasing speed. And this mm-hmm. is possible with all athletes. And I've seen it. Uh, you get an athlete comes to you, he's running, let's say, 11 seconds. Mm-hmm. After doing these exercises, or I've been on his training program, now he's down to 10.8. Mm-hmm. So there's an improvement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it comes in in um, a quite a lot with uh, the martial arts as well. In terms of like, people think they can't punch any faster or kick any faster. Um, when I, I think from like a sports science view, point of view, if they um, maybe if they changed up their training, say if they cut back on the endurance a little bit and maybe brought in more plyometrics or cut down on general exercises and brought in like specialized strength exercises. I think those things are probably things uh, that would allow a lot of people to increase their speed more than they think. I think. Oh, sure. No question about it. Yeah. And, and see, the, the key or I hate to use the term problem, uh, the key is really uh, to analyze the movement. Mm-hmm. See, any athlete, first thing you have to do is analyze what they're doing. Uh, let's say, all right, somebody comes to you and says, okay, I want to get more power in my roundhouse kick. Okay, let's see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Have it film. All right, now, this could be a little faster, this could be a little slower, and let's change the angle, or are you too late doing so? Whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So you do the analysis. Now, what can we do to improve it Mm. or correct it? Mm. So now we go through the corrections, which at the same time, see, when when I do corrections, this is kind of unique. I prescribe a strength exercise to make the corrections. Mm. By doing this, the strength exercise is a specialized exercise that duplicates what they have to do. By doing the exercise, they develop the strength and the neuromuscular pathway over which the strength is displayed. Then eventually we work up to the same type of muscular contraction. Mm-hmm. But at the beginning, the same type of muscular contraction is not important. Most important is learning the movement and the muscles involved in the movement. Mm-hmm. So uh, by doing this, we're making the correction and at the same time, improving the athlete's performance. Okay. And we do this regardless of the action. This is how we make improvements. Mm-hmm. You can't tell an athlete, all right, now I want you doing this. Uh, make sure you get full extension of that knee and really kick hard. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. It's like talking to the wall. Mm-hmm. You have to give an athlete a specific action to work on, mm-hmm. an action that will make him perform better. And performance is the key. Mm-hmm. So um, 
just going back to that point about uh i guess the skill execution in terms of uh like saying drive the knee um do you mean in terms of breaking things down and um doing like a specialized strength exercise that's going to work on knee extension um or uh what do you exactly mean by that <laughs> all right to do an exercise that's going to duplicate the movement we want okay see now most people say okay i want more strength in that last range of motion in the uh extension mm -hmm. most people think of the squat yeah okay. squat is not in my estimation the best mm -hmm. i developed a strength exercise where you do a standing leg extension Okay. In other words, you have the active tubing, active cords hooked up to the ankle. Uh, leg is behind the body. Mm -hmm. You bring the thighs forward, and then you extend the leg. Okay. So that becomes more specialized. Mm -hmm. And it's duplicating what you have to do. Mm -hmm. See, now I'm doing that kick. As you do the kick in the kick, mm -hmm. as you do the knee extension in mm -hmm. the kick. So um, I'm just trying to kind of imagine this uh, exercise for a second, but is, is it similar to the knee extension you would do on a kind of a machine weight only um, just with the active cords? Uh, is that similar or? It's, it's similar if you hook it up to a cable. Okay. You need a free motion type uh, exercise. Okay. Oh. Where you, you could, yeah, it's, it's really free motion where you won't want you hooked up you can duplicate the movements. Mm. But if you're locked into one movement as you are in a, let's say, a leg press or something of this nature, mm -hmm. it's not going to be the same. Okay. Well, that's uh, all the questions that I've uh, that I wrote down. So um, thank you very much for your time. I've had a good time. It's been uh, great talking to you. Yes, and, uh, same here. And maybe we can uh, let the reader know how they can contact me if they want. Uh, yeah. Yep. To take a look at my website, uh, see the different books and videos and so on that I have available. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.